one can flip. Uh, on the right side there is the deck mold. That's the plug there. You can kind of see the orange tooling gel coat, and then they've just got the first couple layers of glass down on top of that. One of the critical things here is you spray the tooling gel, then you back it up with the skin out. Our guys spend a ton of time rolling every little detail, radius, corner, rolling all the air out, because if you get air in the mold, it'll pop out through the gel coat, and every boat you ever built, you will have to repair that problem with. It's a very labor-intensive, um, hugely labor-intensive uh, activity. Not a lot of rocket science, but it does take some talent and a guy with some great attention to detail. Yes? On the longevity of a mold, yeah. you said that you could get 200 boats out of a mold? We would expect to get 150 to 200 out of a whole mold. What do you look for and where in the mold that you need to change it out? You'll see, not unlike a deck or a hull, you'll see gel coat cracks, crazing, signs that the gel coat has started to shift, and gel coat's very brittle, so it'll crack. The mold surface will crack, and then you'll have to start repairing that on every boat. Um, on a hull, that's typically what you see, or sometimes you'll see deformations in the shape. Not the usual cause. On the decks, uh, you'll start to see there's hard corners. Anywhere there's you know a hard corner in a cockpit or a house corner, those hard corners are difficult pulls. It's rough every time you pull apart. So those corners will start to fall apart first. On a deck mold, if we build them in-house, we expect to get 125 to 175 pulls off of a deck mold. Uh, we're currently building the Tartan 3700. We're building hull number 163 right now, and that mold is finally starting to show some wear. So we'll have to think about what we're going to do there in the next year or so to, to repair that mold or replace it. From the tooling and uh, mold building process, we go into the actual build of hull number one. Um, this is where we translate what was 11 months of design work on the 101. Uh, from paper to reality. A uh, big part of the build is, number one, building the first boat, make sure we're happy with it, but also setting up the build for subsequent boats. Uh, we try to make everything as repeatable as possible when we can within our framework. Uh, we document and build the entire thing, and design and build fixtures and tooling to streamline the entire process. Uh, on the left there is a picture of the CNC 101, hull number one, in open hull. So this is before we put the deck on. Uh, in the boat, you can see the bulkheads are already placed. Uh, main, main interior structures there. On the right there, that piece of wood kind of in the middle is actually the chart table. Um, on the left there is the galley. It's all covered up in cardboard. But the guts of the boat are there. Uh, we try to build as much as we can before we put the deck on because it gets more difficult afterwards. <coughs> then the picture on the right is uh, hole number one nearing completion. You can see rails, lifeline stanchions are up in place. Uh, winches are there, deck hardware. This is kind of closer to the end of the build. The last couple things we'll do is we'll put in hatches and port lights. Uh, plastic items like that that can be scratched during the build, we try to leave off as long as we can. So the exciting part, once we get done building the boat, we actually get to put her in the water. Uh, on the left there was uh, the initial launch of CNC 101, hull number one. Uh, it was done in Fairport Harbor, Ohio on what was the only rainy day, I think, all of last summer. <laughs> <laughs> boat went together really well. I will confess, you know, this was my first design, kind of on my own from start to finish. Uh, we launched the boat the first time. It's pouring down rain. Nobody really wants to be outside. Travel lift operator lowers the boat into the water. Says he's got all the weight off the straps. I'm standing there looking at the boat, and the bow's about four and a half inches out of the water. I'm going, oh God, there's no way I did this that wrong, you know? <laughs> Finally go back and drag the travel lift operator out of his truck, ask him to hop back up on the travel lift. He drops the forward strap, and the boat floats right on our lines. I tell you, I breathed a huge sigh of relief from that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was kind of the day she went in the water, pouring down rain, ugly, nasty, but uh, in about four and a half hours, we got the boat put together and ready to transport. We were set up for uh, a Friday in late July to take the boat from Fairport Harbor over to uh, Rocky River, her new home club, and kind of had a tight deadline because on Saturday morning she was entered in the Cleveland Yacht Club Leukemia Cup Regatta for her, her debut. Um, of course, Friday morning, head down there and head out to the lake. Oh, look at that. It's 6.30 puffing to 35 out of the northeast. Certainly not the conditions we're looking for on the maiden sail. Um, we kind of hung out for a little bit, waited until shortly after afternoon and decided to go for it. We got out to the lake, getting out of the harbor at Fairport Harbor wasn't much fun, I'll tell you that. Um, <laughs> once we got out of there and turned left, it was a downwind sleigh ride the whole way. 
Uh, you can kind of see off the back of the boat there, you know, the boat's getting and going. You can't really see the scope of the waves, but as I mentioned, with a main hook alone, we hit 17.3 knots oh, under complete control. I mean, we're standing in the back of the cockpit. You've got that wide open platform. You're standing there comfortably. It was just a great, it was a phenomenal ride. So as I mentioned, um, late July 2012, her first regatta was the Cleveland Yacht Club Leukemia Cup regatta. Right out of the box with Dacron sails because the racing rags weren't ready, she tied for first in the first, first regatta. Um, it was up against a, a guy that I grew up kind of sailing with and for, a gentleman named Bill O'Dell who's been sailing in the Cleveland area forever. Uh, been sailing a Shock 35, a great light air boat for a long time. And uh, in a light air regatta, when I was able to hang with him, he knew he had trouble this com coming this next season. Uh, after that, in the fall of 2012, we started to get recognition nationally. Um, the boat was awarded Best Performance Cruiser, 30 to 39 feet from Cruising World Magazine, as well as being over, overall Domestic Boat of the Year. She was also nominated for a Best Boat Award from uh, Sail Magazine. Um, the reception that we've gotten on the boat has been phenomenal. Uh, it's been a really, really special experience to kind of go through. Uh, lead, charge, lead the group of talented people at Tartan Sea and Sea Yachts to see this thing become reality. Um, one of the things I, I don't know that I, I kind of forgot to mention is I was lucky enough that hull number one is my family's boat, so I was able to convince my dad to get into that, and I get to sail her every weekend. It's, it's a great deal for me. I think that's the bulk of what I got. What kind of questions? Do they, do they, does Tartan use balsa, ingrained balsa in their decks? Yeah, the decks are ingrained balsa. But anywhere we're going to put a penetration, a piece of hardware, a hole of any kind, will be into solid fiberglass. So we'll actually lay out, we know before we ever build the deck, where every piece of hardware, where every hole is going to go, so that we pull the balsa back, go into solid glass, and don't have the possibility of introducing water to the balsa that 5, 10, 20 years down the road creates the rot and the problems that are associated with balsa. We do the same thing in every hull we build. Everywhere there's a through hull, any, any penetration will be into solid fiberglass on all of our boats. Yeah, Brian. Yeah, Tom, I just saw this year that Profile is introducing a roller uh, ball arrangement for spinnakers. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with that at all? And how yeah, there's a, there's a couple different variants on the market. I haven't used or seen the Profile one. I do have some experience with one from Selden and one from Carver. They typically call them a top-down furler. Um, I've tried them. When they work, they work great. I had some difficulty with them too. Um, not having sailed a ton of them, I, you know, not a ton of advice, except for the fact that uh, a good supplier of ours from North Sales just talked one of my clients out of doing one. So that was kind of his take on it. He said he had used five or six of them and hadn't been happy with them. Yeah. Do you? What kind of process do you use when you lay up the holes? Is that that? resin infused process where you vacuum bag it and all that? We do, we do. Um, it was back uh, in 2002, I believe it was, with the CNC 99. We went to a, a resin infusion process. One of the things that we do here is we basically, we spray the gel coat and what we call a skin out layer behind it into the mold, be it the hull mold or the deck mold. We then let that harden, grind it, and prep it to go from there. Once that's done, we lay the fiberglass laminates into the mold with all the fiberglasses dry. So our guys have the time to properly organize and arrange the fiberglass laminates according to the laminate schedules that we've put together. Reinforcements in heavily loaded areas, get the cuts, the overlaps, the perfs, everything absolutely right. They've got the time to get it right before we introduce resin. Once all the glass coring, all the laminates, hard goods are there, we then put a bag over the entire mold, be it the hull mold or the deck mold. It's basically a giant, it's a 413 inch wide bag we have a polyethylene film that we put over the top of the mold, and we tape around the edges of the mold to seal that bag down to the mold. We then pull a vacuum underneath that mold, and once we've pulled the vacuum, can guarantee that we can hold at least 27 inches of mercury on our gauge. A little optimistic, I'm sure, but you know, once we can hold that number, we'll go ahead and infuse the boat, which basically means we introduce resin to the system. We take a 55-gallon drum of resin that has feed lines in it that are feeding throughout various points of the boat, open up the resin and let it flow into the boat. Atmospheric pressure actually pushes the resin out of the drum into the vacuum to, to eliminate that vacuum and it allows the resin to propagate through the whole boat. We get a boat that is built to exacting weight standards because we know exactly how much resin goes in there. We get a well compressed laminate. It 
minimizes all the voids. You know, it's the best thing you can do to build a current composite laminate short of autoclave curing. And we can also guarantee that, you know, we know the glass package is where it is. Everything is as it should be in that, in that laminate. One of the things we've done over the last couple of years is we've introduced clear gel coats to the hulls. That way, after we infuse it, we can see both sides of the laminate. We know through a visual inspection that everything's okay. Um, the other big added benefit with the infusion process is environmental for both the environment and our employees. They're not handling wet resin. It's not a wet, sticky mess. And there are no, v well, not no VOCs, yeah. but greatly reduced VOCs through that process versus a traditional hand lamp. Yeah? Um, how much weight does uh, carbon, uh, carbon fiber uh, spar uh, reduce over a uh, you know, standard traditional aluminum spar? And also, uh, where does the water go in the um, <coughs> is there a grain or something like that? Because it's got to come out of there somewhere. It does. Uh, on the first question, the carbon fiber, our carbon fiber masts, the mast itself, just the mast tube, typically weighs 60% less than an aluminum mast tube. Mm -hmm. By the time you add in spreaders, fittings, everything, it's about a 40% reduction. Um, on our Tartan 5300, that rig all up weighs about 414 pounds. Uh, in aluminum, it'd be 750, 800, something like that. So it's a huge weight savings, which translates into better performance on the water. We've got less pitching, less yaw. I mean, all in all, it's a better, better performing boat that way. Uh, to the second point on the 101 with the trough, we molded a trough into the deck that the, the sprit basically sits on top of this trough. That trough is sealed to the bow so no, no water can get into the inside of the boat. There's a pitch on that trough so that it drains. There's a drainage hole right in the front. Any water that comes in goes right out the trough, right out the front of the bow, back into the lake. Yeah. Either. <laughs> yeah, I'm. I'm, uh, I'm curious. I mean, I hear all these men talking about all the sailing, you know, things, and that's that's great. But the inside of the boat, how much emphasis do you put on the comfort level of the boat for us women who you know, like to hang out inside the boat, and, you know, sleep and make the bed, which can be a real pain in the butt for anybody that's ever made a bed on a boat. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. Um. How much emphasis? Do you we, we get excited talking about the sailing and the outside of it, but we know the inside is what sells the wife, and that's what's ultimately going to sell the boat. Um, we're, not, we're not dumb. You know, on, on two different models, the CNC yacht's a little bit more performance oriented. Um, there's going to be less bright work, less wood, a little bit less opulent down below. Tartan side, it's going to be solid, handcrafted American hardwoods. Um, High quality materials in terms of leathers, ultra leather, ultra suede, uh, high level of finishes across everything. And then we also offer the cu customization side of it. So, you know, you don't like the layout, we can change that. You don't like the wood, we can change that. Our traditional wood is an American cherry. Uh, in the last two years, we've built boats out of maple, walnut, mahogany, and cherry. Um, all has its each interesting look. Drawbacks, pluses, and benefits to each, but, you know, we can customize to kind of whatever level you want. Um, what we've found is that uh, in today's marketplace, I mean, there's no illusion that uh, things are great in the marine industry. Um, we are lucky enough that we've survived. We're actually doing pretty well now. And it, we think it's because of that level of customization that we offer that just about nobody else out there does, uh, that we're doing so well today. Uh, in terms of the styling side of it, we do have some interior de decorators, interior design consultants that we use, particularly on the Tartan line for the development of a new boat. Again, you know, that carving out that niche market, customization, personalization is what kind of separates us from the production guys, and it's allowed us to survive as a, a low volume, small house here in Northeast Ohio. Yes? Why don't you have any presence, or I haven't seen it, at the Cleveland Boat Show? Great question. We actually had a presence at the Cleveland Boat Show for the first time in seven years this year. Um, the biggest reason from our standpoint, was that until this year the Cleveland Boat Show was 11 days long and overlapped with the Chicago Boat Show. We had to choose between Cleveland and Strictly Sail in Chicago. Strictly Sail Chicago is a bigger show for us. Um, this year they shortened it down to a long weekend, made it much more manageable, and we had the added benefit of the new CNC 101 and the Fantail. Two boats there, great for Lake Erie and local lakes. So we thought it made a lot of sense to go to the Cleveland Boat Show, and we're very happy with what happened. Uh, we got some phenomenal press out of it. Front page, <coughs> plain dealer, uh, yeah, I think it was front page. 
Uh, Channel 3 News featured us pretty well. And we actually sold a couple boats, which was a, an extra added benefit of the Cleveland Boat Show for us this year. Uh, if it continues to be the long weekend format, we'll certainly seriously try to go again next year. Uh, if it goes back to 11 days as a small company, that's very difficult for us to manage. Yeah? Um, I get Sailing World Magazine, and I don't think, unless I've missed it, that I've seen any, any, any real press on the 101 in, in Sailing World, nor have I seen any advertising. Uh, am I missing it, or...? Um, there have been a couple of editorials by Dave Reed, the editor of Sailing World for the 101. Uh, she was part of the Boat of the Year competition for the, 101, uh, for the overall last year. Uh, did not win, unfortunately. Um, Advertising-wise, no, we've cut back on Sailing World in the last, uh, basically since the fall boat show. Uh, our magazine advertisements are cyclical. We'll ramp up for the fall for Annapolis, Newport. You know, the big fall season, you'll see a lot of targeted CNC ads. Uh, once that is kind of over and the winter shows are over, we, we throttle back, and that's just normal operating procedure for us. One, one additional question. Uh, did you have a, a strategy in mind? I mean, uh, where do you think the boat is going to, on the race course is going to perform best? Uh, light air, heavy air? Um, she, she'll, do, she'll do really well in light air. Um, she's got plenty of horsepower. Um, Designed to be a boat that I want to go sail on Lake Erie, which is typically light air. Uh, the other end of the spectrum in the heavy air, she's light enough that downwind she'll get up and go. She'll be really quick, quick to surf, quick to plane, but still easily managed. So in the light and the heavy, she'll do very well. Quite frankly, where the boat might struggle is the middle of the range. The 12 to, 12 to 14, 16 knots where everybody's going hull speed, kind of about as fast as they can. The symmetrical boats will all be pulled back, running dead downwind and headed straight towards the mark, where we've got to reach around a little bit. So that, if there is a hole in our arsenal, that'll be it. Thank you. Yeah. Back. yeah. Far back. I got a question oh. on uh, sailboat design. I, what I've noticed like, in the last five years is a lot of designers are going away from like the sort of standard small port lights to these gigantic port lights, let's say like on the bateau that are kind of look like a giant cat's eye or something, and then the ray salon. Uh, can you comment on the safety factor of that kind of design change? Why is it happening? Is it just for comfort? Comfort's going to be the big reason. Uh, you know, it allows you to introduce a whole lot more light to the interior space of the boat. Um, in terms of safety, as long as it's done properly and well executed with good materials, you'll be fine. Uh, there are ISO standards relevant to openings such as port lights and hatches and, and relative strength tests they need to be. Uh, glass standards if you're using a real glass or acrylic lex hand standards if you're going that route. Uh, one of the things we do is every boat we build almost every boat with the exception of the, the, the day sailor, is rated for a CE category